Hi everybody, in my last video we looked at the generic ways in which we can section market failure. We said we can look at the types of market failure in terms of those that promote excessive risk and then the risk of bank failure and total financial market collapse. We also looked at collusive activity between financial market agents, between banks for example, and price fixing of interest rates and exchange rates that can happen which goes against the interests of society which can lead to welfare losses in society. Uh, in this video, we're going to look at the four specific types of market failure, which we can then put into these groups. Let's start by looking at speculation and market bubbles. This will fall into the excessive risk uh, section of market failure, financial market failure here. Right, speculation occurs when assets are bought at a low price and they're then sold on at a higher price, making the profit difference between. Great, very simple idea, right? The problem is, though, what if the assets that you're buying end up falling in value? Big trouble, because you're sitting on losses there. Even worse, if that deal is a leveraged deal. Let's take a pause here and understand a leveraged deal. So a normal deal is a very simple idea. You're sitting on £10,000. You decide, using your own financial market skill, to buy high-profile, lucrative and liquid assets. Assets that you know other people out there in financial markets will want to buy from you. You're also a very good salesperson, so you can market these assets and sell them for £11,000, giving you a nice tidy profit of £1,000. That's the basic idea of speculation. Buy low, sell higher, make the profit in between. A leverage deal goes way beyond this though. Really exciting idea if you leverage this deal. There is a definition of a leverage deal, and that is borrowing to amplify the end outcome of a deal. There's you again sitting on £10,000. The difference now is that you go to a lender and you borrow 990,000 more pounds, which of course you're gonna pay back at a later date. You also agree, because it's borrowed money, that you're gonna pay back interest at 10,000 pounds. It means now you're sitting on a million pounds. You do the same thing as before. You now go and you buy these high profile, lucrative and liquid assets, assets that you know people will want, people are gonna buy. You go and find a buyer, because you're a great salesperson, you can sell them, for £1,100,000, which gives you that at the end. But look, there are costs of the deal we've got to take away before we look at the profit here. So there's you with £1,100,000, the cost there, you've got to pay back the £990,000, you've got to pay the interest of £10,000, and we've got to take away the initial £10,000. So the total cost of the deal, the £1,010,000, right? There's you with £1,100,000, it means the profit at the end is £90,000. Everyone is happy. You pay back the lender, the bank, right? You've got to pay back the interest too. And there's you on 90K. Everyone is happy. Fantastic news. The buyer is happy because they've got these great assets they're holding too. And look at the outcome. 90,000 instead of 1,000. Amazing outcome. Amazing return. Borrowing to amplify the end outcome of a deal. Leverage deals seem great, right? Really exciting. Huge sums of money to be made. But what if all this borrowing and buying up assets is creating a bubble? where people just keep thinking prices are going to rise, they're going to rise, they're going to rise. Banks are willing to lend, right? there is easy money out there, to pump into the buying of these assets. Well, it creates these artificially, excessively high estimates of price increases. It allows prices to keep rising, right? But eventually there comes a point in time where investors realize that these assets are not worth these ridiculously high prices, ludicrous price valuations you're putting on these assets, guys. You know, we're not going to buy these anymore. There ends up being a fall in demand, a big fall in price, and those who have borrowed loads of money and are sitting on now these assets that are falling in price start to panic. They start to sell these assets, exacerbating the price falls even more. The end result is that all these people who have leveraged these deals and have borrowed loads of money sitting on these assets are now sitting on worthless assets. Okay, people who have bought them up, worthless assets. All of a sudden now, if these deals are leveraged, how do people pay back their debts? They're in deep trouble. Not just them, but the bank that they borrowed from is in deep trouble. There can be full failure. Now, if the individual is representing a bank, that bank might go bust if these deals are massive in value. Right? Bad news, bank failure there. The commercial bank who's lent lots of money to investors looking to leverage these deals will not get paid back. They can go bust. The end result, all these bank failures, systemic risk, potential financial collapse, bad, bad news. Another cause of financial market failure is asymmetric information, which can lead to moral hazard and adverse selection. And we spent a lot of time looking at moral hazard. We said that moral hazard is when a risk or a decision is taken by a bank, where if that decision goes bad, then a third party will bear the cost of that. 
So for example, right, uh, excessive risk is taken and really dodgy loans are given out to dodgy people. Um, those loans go bad, the bank then goes insolvent, well so what? We've got the central bank, we've got the government who's going to bail us out. Not an issue at all. And what does that do? It encourages the idea of excessive risk. It encourages bad loans to keep being issued out. Where banks feel that they are too big to fail. The government's always there or the central bank is always there to bail them out. So the idea of asymmetric information is a problem because banks will always know what they're doing. They'll always know the risks that they're taking. They'll always know the new derivatives or the new kind of assets that they're creating to lend out to different people. And they can hide that information from the regulators. They can hide that information from the government, right? So excessive risk can be taken knowing that if things go bad, they're going to be bailed out. But regulators won't know that they're doing it. So asymmetric information can lead to moral hazard and excessive risk with the idea of banks thinking that they're too big to fail, they're always going to be bailed out if things go bad. But also asymmetric information can lead to adverse selection. Adverse selection is when the most likely buyers of a financial product are those buyers that the seller would prefer not to sell to. And the reason that happens is due to imper imperfect information, asymmetric information, between the buyers and sellers. Those who end up buying are those that the seller would prefer not to sell to. Right? The end result, excessive risk is being taken because those who are buying are the worst kind of buyers uh, and then potential collapse of that financial intermediary or that financial institution. Let's look at an, an actual example here with respect to health insurance and health insurance companies. The premiums issued by the health insurance company will be based on who they think is most likely to buy it. Remember, the premium is just the monthly cost of a consumer taking out health insurance. Um, so the health insurance company will base premiums on who they think is likely to buy it, right? But the problem is that the healthy consumers will always think that's a bad deal for them. They're in good health. They're good. These guys are good consumers, highly profitable for the health insurance company. But they'll look at those premiums and think, look, they're way too high. I don't need to buy those premiums. I'm not likely to need to claim. I'm in good health, right? So they're not going to buy it. Whereas the poor health consumers will always think that, wow, this is great value, fantastic value, let me buy it. Because I'm going to need to make claims, and when I make claims, the insurance company is going to pay out for me. That's much cheaper than if I had to pay the full health cost myself. So they're always going to buy, they're always going to think good value. But these are bad buyers for the insurance companies. These are very costly consumers for the insurance companies. These are unprofitable consumers, given the amount of claims that these guys are going to make. The end result, though, is because of the asymmetric information here, because of the fact that premiums are always going to attract the wrong buyers as opposed to the good buyers, is that only the bad buyers will end up buying. The bad consumers, the poor health consumers, will end up buying unprofitable consumers for the health insurance companies, risking huge losses and potential collapse. Increasing premiums will only make things worse, right? And the cycle continues. So moral hazard and adverse selection occur because of asymmetric information which can then lead to excessive risk being taken and financial intermediaries and financial institutions going bust. Negative externalities might be being ignored by commercial bankers who are taking excessive risk. So it falls under this branch here. What kind of negative externalities? Well, the cost of the taxpayer bank bailouts. The idea being too big to fail, right? They ignore the impact on the taxpayer of having to pay for these huge bailouts. The loss of individual savings in their bank, you know, might be completely ignored. The lost jobs, the lost incomes, the lost growth, not just in the financial industry of systemic financial collapse, but throughout the entire economy. These consequences might well be ignored by commercial bankers or investment bankers who take excessive risk. Um, and as a, res as a result, they overproduce very risky financial assets. And also market rigging. This falls in to this section of market failure. And this is where traders, bankers, intermediaries, they get together, they collude to manipulate markets and to fix prices to increase their profits markedly. What kind of uh, prices are we talking about being fixed here? Well, for example, LIBOR on Forex, some really interesting case studies for you to go and research to understand how LIBOR on Forex was fixed in recent years. Incredible stories, really. So fixing LIBOR, the London Interbank Offer Rate, that's the interbank lending rate between, uh, between banks. That is a big, big thing to fix, considering how important that is. Uh, that's the interest rate that lo loads of other kind of savings rates and borrowing rates are based on. So fixing that is really manipulating the market significantly. But also, can you believe manipulating forex markets, exchange rates? Incredible to think about it. 
in whichever way that suited these bankers, that suited these, uh, these corporations. And we've got names like Barclays and JP Morgan in here. Incredible to think the kind of plays involved with market rigging and fixing. And even though there are heavy fines and regulations in place, such fixing can still take place if enforcement and punishment is weak. So pretty interesting stuff here. We get monopoly pricing. Uh, scary though, really scary to know that this can still take place. This is big, big source of financial market failure, market rigging there. That covers all the four major types of financial market failure. Thank you so much for watching guys. I'll see you all in the next video.